bit about uh, our speaker today. Uh, uh, Jeremy uh, got his uh, SB MIT physics, sounds like me too, uh, in 83. And uh, he continued his uh, physics uh, education at the University of Illinois. Uh, I did the same, that's interesting, with a master's, master's and a PhD. Um, and uh, then after that, he did a postdoc at uh, first at the Watson, IBM Watson Center. I believe that's over in, uh, uh, over, over by the Hudson. Uh, and uh, then uh, Argonne National Labs in uh, Illinois. Uh, he joined Kodak for a 20 year career there. And uh, he left uh, Kodak in uh, Kodak a few years ago and uh, joined IDX Health and Science where he's currently a principal engineer. Um, but with respect to global warming, it's, it's interesting the way things come around for the, for the, for the clubs here. Um, he became aware of uh, global warming in the 1990s. And then um, uh, when, we, when um, the past administration withdrew us from the uh, Paris Climate Accord, uh, he became much more uh, interested in it, much more proactive in it. And um, we had, I believe that the MIT Club of Rochester can claim some credit for this. We had a couple of uh, uh, seminars regarding global warming uh, back a year, year and a half ago. And uh, that I believe, Jer Jer Jeremy, you can correct me, please, uh, when I when in, in a minute. But uh, that got him interested in the alumni uh, uh, climate action group, which is a group of alumni that are trying to do more than just discuss climate action. They're trying to right. figure out what they got to do to get it done. And so he's going to talk about a roadmap that he was assigned, uh, that he and he and his team have developed to help guide the MIT alumni climate action group. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jeremy, and uh, you can uh, correct me, uh, you know, and uh, add to uh, my introduction for you. But sure, again, sure. thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, um, so yes, I attended a, uh, a, a chapter meeting and uh, the topic was climate change. And we had um, a political cartoonist featured and he was talking about his concerns. And, um, you know, we talked, it was a big discussion afterwards, what can be done? And in fact, that discussion played out over weeks and emails uh, amongst all the participants. And somebody who had been at the talk uh, mentioned she was in uh, MACA and encouraged me to join. And I, I thought about it. And in fact, uh, Michael Laird uh, followed up and kept prodding me to join that group. And I think Michael pushed me over the edge. And uh, <laughs> So um, I joined uh, the part of the, the, some of the meetings that he was attending initially uh, on a regular basis. And as I got involved, I, I got to meet uh, Shil uh, Dasarma and um, I was interested in legislation, not knowing much about legislation, but knowing that you know, we do have to uh, move here. And so uh, the group I was involved with, I'll discuss a little more about MACA, but the group that I was involved with uh, is trying to engage with um, our political leadership. And so I was interested in learning more about what legislation had been crafted or was in the works. And uh, after volunteering to write the legislation section of this roadmap, I got hooked into actually coordinating the completion of the document and expanding sections and editing sections and so on. So that's how I got, I got into it. Um, and yes, in the, in the 90s um, and early 2000s, uh, thin film scientists and engineers had heard about chlorofluorocarbons uh, and they heard a little bit about greenhouse gases. Uh, but eventually, um, a lot of these technical societies invited guest speakers who were very knowledgeable in the climate science, in fact, active participants on the international scale to talk to us about it. And seeing how little was done since back even as early as 2007 was kind of alarming. Um, so I'll make some acknowledgements first. Priscilla uh, Ditya Dasarma is the founder of MACA and uh, he's been a bit of a mentor to me as I've become more involved and helped me uh, in planning my communications with local leaders and so on. Um, I must also thank, of course, the co-authors of this roadmap for responding to climate change. And they're Shill, myself, Rowena Lowe, Bruce Parker, 
John Dabbles, Rick Clemenzi, Michael Rubin, Liliana Pimentel, Priya Giri, Claude Gerstel, Tim Connors, Michael Laird, Matteo Williams, and Stephen Sherwood. And uh, we do have a website and uh, the address is shown there. Um, and I'm just gonna cover three topics. I'll spend uh, roughly two thirds of it on the third topic, the roadmap as a tool for advocacy and engagement. But I'll give a brief introduction to what is MACA and then uh, a discussion of what the roadmap is. We can't go through that roadmap here, but um, I can show how we plan to use it and how we have used it. Um, so what is MACA? It is the MIT Alumni for Climate Action. Uh, we're a nonpartisan group concerned about the devastating effects of climate change. We support communicating the urgency of the problem and science-based interventions to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, MACA has, I would say, five key thrusts. One is ed education and outreach, and Tamara Ledley uh, is, and, and Tim Connors as well um, present this En-ROADS Climate Change Solution Simulator as a platform to teach teachers, students, um, uh, people in the, in the you know, public sector and people in the private sector on um, what what things can help have an impact uh, to mitigate the temperature rise uh, from greenhouse gas emission. So the simulator is interactive and you can make policy decisions and technology decisions on the fly and then test out, you know, what the results might be in a simulator projected way. Uh, there's also a technology thrust and Bruce Parker, I believe, heads up that group. And they discuss everything, you know, from renewables, zero carbon fuels and vehicles, energy efficient buildings and communities, carbon sequestration, all, all the kinds of nuts and bolts, engineering science technology that needs to be applied to this problem. Uh, there's another group, uh, Michael Rubin heads up on climate justice. It's in talking about equitable sharing of the burden of addressing the climate challenge. Um, and dealing with climate and environmental justice issues. Then there's an advocacy thrust, which is aimed at engaging public officials, engaging communities, influencing not just legislation per se, but the thinking of the people who will be crafting it or be discussing it or, or uh, otherwise you know, engaged in it. And then finally, there's an MIT campus thrust. I believe Priya Jiri is heading that up and the goal there is to engage MIT in reducing its carbon footprint in a meaningful way. So what is the MACA roadmap? It's uh, a 55 page document with something like 200 references. It's in two main sections. There's a background with a summary of the climate crisis and then there's a recommendation section. And the recommendations can be summarized as follows. There are two key points. We need to act immediately and we don't know how to do it all. We're gonna need an innovation down the road, but we gotta get started right away, even before we know what we'll need in say 2030 or 2040, we need to do things now. Um, and in more detail, there are six broad recommendations for actions across all sectors of the economy. Things that need to be done it basically, it touches every sector of the economy. So the summary recommendations, you know, further summarized here uh, are those two key points, immediate action and innovations required. Um, and the six recommendations are to enact net zero or carbon neutral legislation, to replace fossil fuels with carbon free energy, to electrify and decarbonize transportation systems, to improve buildings and communities, to reform land management and agricultural practices, and then to apply technology to achieve net zero by bringing about negative emissions, carbon capture and sequestration or whatever we can do. Because the reality is, as, as little time as we have to draw down our emissions, there will be stubborn, um, difficult to re reduce emissions processes, industrial processes and such. Uh, and in order to offset those emissions, we'll have to do something. And whether it's natural, artificial, technological, uh, it has to be done and it has to be done at scale. 
Um, so when I got involved in this and I heard there was a roadmap, and at the time it was a skeleton, um, I saw some thoughts fleshed out. And I said, well, why don't I see a roadmap? Because in my mind, a roadmap is a visual thing as well. It, it's a map that puts you on a path to getting to your destination. And road mapping techniques are well known in technology development, in process development, in product development. Um, so I was surprised not to see a roadmap. And I was uh, encouraged to go ahead and, and put a graphic together that could somehow help us visualize the, the scale of the problem. And the reason I think it's so important to do this is, you know, even when you think of the product and process things that are routinely roadmapped, those are very simple in comparison to what we're facing. So each one of these paths shown in different colors here could easily expand when you get down to the next level or two uh, into hundreds of major projects. So this graphic really represents thousands of <laughs> serious projects and it's daunting. And to think that we could pass a simple law or do one simple thing and solve this big problem um, is kind of foolish. And so I think we need to be honest with each other and honest with our politicians that, you know, a little piece of legislation isn't gonna do it. And what this roadmap graphic is supposed to represent is the complexity of what has to be done but an organization to what has to be done. So on the upper left, you see a legislative raft. You've got broad targets that we have to say we're committed to 50% reduction by 2030, 100% by 2050. We also have to have sector specific targets. We have to eliminate carbon subsidies, de-incentivize carbon, incentivize sustainability. We have to have a climate authority, a climate action authority that will help prioritize technology investments, incentivize circular economy and drive these paths, you know, that orange bar sort of initiates these uh, paths in renewables, in um, low carbon, zero carbon transportation, in pulling carbon out of um, buildings and communities and industry, uh, dealing with forestry and agriculture and, and so on. So the technology roadmap viewpoint in my mind is, is uh, expressed here in these simple points. Success in addressing large challenges and opportunities requires a coordinated and planned approach. Available solutions for immediate concerns must be prioritized and implemented rapidly. In parallel, work that addresses unsolved problems must be prioritized and initiated. And then learnings from near-term work and research and development to address the intermediate term and longer term needs are applied to make decisions on future paths. And that's an important point. This roadmap is dynamic. As you start down the roadmap, you find out things and you make choices and decisions. And when you flesh out such a roadmap, there are decision points and there are deadlines and you, you know, things are um, uh, brought in that work and thrown out that don't work and so on. In contrast, and this is what the roadmap isn't, um, <laughs> is the consensus legislation viewpoint. And I'll, I'll read the bullets, but my, my, my kind of cynical summary is, given several decades and modest to insignificant amounts of resources on an annual basis, a problem can be solved. And I'll be blunt, this is the way our government thinks. This is the way Congress thinks. This is the way your representatives think by and large, you know, until recently. Um, this is the way things get done. It takes 50 years to do anything. So <laughs> success is defined as finding common ground legislation that could pass both houses of Congress. Jurisdiction of committees involved in the crafting of legislation determines its scope. Incentives and disincentives guide market forces to drive change. Palatability of measures is more important than efficacy of measures. And we don't have time for this. Um, so this roadmap I have you know, put, put forth as a tool of engagement. Um, and I think that was part of Shill's vision as well for this. Um, and uh, uh, you know, several of my colleagues share this view. And uh, we started with crafting sort of boilerplates, formula. So formula for letter, formula for presentation. I'm gonna go through the formula for letter first. Who, how do you contact somebody? Who do you contact and all of that? So you start with a specific connection to an elected official's view or accomplishment. 
in an example, I'll show you one of them. I reached out to Joe Morelli, our local um, representative. Uh, you present something visual to grab attention and contextualize the connection. This little roadmap graphic uh, serves as a nice conversation piece. And then after you connect all that, you make a specific request. So I had reached out to Joe Morelli's office before, shortly after joining MACA, with a kind of vague request to discuss climate change with them on behalf of MACA. And would he be willing to meet with some MACA members? And you can easily imagine that got nowhere. Um, I, if I sent it through the email, email system on the web, I got an acknowledgement that the message was received. But um, I even got as far as a phone call from one of his staffers pointing me to where I could get a uh, form to fill out a scheduling form. I filled out the scheduling form. No meeting ever came of it. And I can totally understand that if I were Joe Morelli and I read that request, I'd say, I don't have time for this. So, but I at least had that staffer's email and phone number. And that was kind of in my back pocket. Then I attended a citizens panel event and um, Joe Morelli was there talking about his interest in addressing climate change. And he specifically mentioned work with the citizens climate lobby. Um, and he mentioned that he was supportive of a carbon, uh, carbon fee. So I took, the opportunity to connect with that event that I attended. And as you can see, you know, in this letter, I attended a recent citizens panel event in which you engaged with, and I can't read this because my toolbar is on top of it. There we go. Engaged with constituents on the topic of climate change. I thanked him for the work he was do doing. I, uh, I expressed appreciation for the amount of knowledge he had gained and how he'd educated himself and his staff. Um, and I mentioned that, uh, you know, I was interested to hear that he was supportive of a carbon price. And then I put that carbon price in the context of this, this graphic and pointed out it's just a tiny piece in this upper left corner. And there's so much more to talk about. And so I mentioned that I and others at uh, MACA would be interested in discussing this roadmap. And would, we, would he be willing to meet with us um, to discuss this roadmap? And I made a further request because I knew through some of the work I'd done as part on behalf of MACA, that um, Congressman Tonko in the Albany area um, had, has been active in crafting climate legislation. And uh, I was interested in reaching out to him or his committee. So I was wondering if Joe Morelli, as a fellow representative from New York, could make a connection. So that was the, the request, that was the ask. It basically followed that formula. and. After sending that, it didn't take long at all. I very quickly got um, contact from Kaylee Benedict, the deputy district manager. And uh, this is what she said. Thank you for reaching out, happy to connect on this, addressing climate change as a top priority, so on and so on, and offered some times and dates. So um, we actually did set up a meeting and Tom Hirasuna and Michael Laird and Shill and I all had a nice discussion with Kaylee and I'll talk more about what happened at that meeting. Um, then we more recently reached out to Senator Gillibrand and I went to the website and saw that she was extremely bullish on middle-class jobs for America. And so she didn't mention the American jobs plan but she mentioned how she really supports bringing back the middle class in America. And so I used that as the connection point connected it to the Americans job plan, which of course has a big climate com component to it. And so I spun it that way and talked about how action in all sectors of the economy to address climate change represents I'm a coming. huge opportunity for jobs for middle-class America. Then so, the, right. the request, would you be willing to meet with us for a discussion on how our roadmap compares with and can help reinforce the American jobs plan and so on. And once again, Thanks for reaching out. I'd be more than happy to meet. Now this comes from Jared Jones, uh, Senator Gillibrand's district, uh, uh, sorry, state director. Um, I will point out in addition to sending that email with the graphic, I sent a follow-up explaining that uh, we had met with Kaylee Benedict and she had actually provided his content to us. So that kind of helped grease the skids. But again, the response was quick, 
we set up a meeting and boom, we had an hour of this guy's time. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little more later about what came of those meetings, but that I just wanted to present those as formula letters that are tailored to specific officials. Um, I will also mention that how you choose what officials to discuss things with um, is a strategy. And there are two aspects to it. One is um, cultivating people who are in a position to make big decisions with your point of view. And so you wanna reach out to people who are in high positions on relevant committees of importance in the Senate or, or the um, House of Representatives. And you have to do a little legwork on the web, but you can easily find out who they are and where they are. And if you happen to be in the right district, you have a direct link. If you're not in the right district, you have to start making connections. Uh, the other side of it is you might need to talk to people who are in the opposition. And uh, we'll talk later about you know comments made by people who are advocates of change, uh, advocates of action, um, saying that it is important to to talk to these other people. How you hook them in is, is a different story. So the second formula thing is the presentation. Um, and what I've listed here is a fairly bare bones kind of presentation. You have an agenda slide with intros and thanks. Roadmap summary discussion is, is the basic agenda. I've taken four slides to define the crisis. I'll show you how that looks. And it's important to frame it in terms of the remaining carbon budget. The clock is ticking. We're burning through our budget. And that message needs to come through clearly. Uh, then a slide summarizing recommendations. And it's important when you summarize those recommendations to make connections to the views and the positions of the person you're talking with. Uh, then you can bring on the slide uh, with the roadmap graphic to discuss the technology roadmap engineering approach. Um, you can have slides with policy comparisons, slides putting the challenge into context with other great challenges of you know, the past century or so. And then a slide with an active link to the roadmap document or a MACA, web, MACA website and so on. If there's time for a tour, you can take a diversion and, and give a tour of the document itself. But finally, you end with a discussion slide that has more specific requests for information, for contacts, for how MACA can play a role and a final statement of just how urgent things are. Uh, so this might be your, your opening slide here. It's, it's a meeting. You've got a month, day, and year. You've got a key staffer whose name's gonna be there, your name, other names. Uh, uh, you put your state, your district, and so on. Um, you have this graphic as a, as a kind of conversation piece. Now you get into you know, defining the problem. And I won't go through these slides as I would with an elected official, but I'll just say that, you know, putting the temperature change into geological timescale context is helpful and important. And to point out that in the, in, in the geological blink of an eye, we are going to set ourselves back, you know, tens of millions of years to a time when there might not be any more uh, polar ice caps. You know, this is, is a problem. Uh, and the message really should be that how severe our difficulties are is tied directly to the amount of temperature change we're gonna allow ourselves to cause. And, you know, unfortunately we humans are in the driver's seat here much as we would not like to be. We're doing it and we've, we've got to stop, right? Um, you have a shocker slide, you know, about the costs of the crisis. This is an important slide, the carbon budgets. Uh, and what it's, this is basically distilled from the IPCC data, uh, thanks to, um, um, Bruce Parker. And uh, what it says is if you want to have a two thirds shot of not exceeding um, a temperature on this chart, you follow the dark blue line. And at the temperature where that dark blue line hits, you look at the uh, x axis and find out what your carbon budget is. So if you want to keep things to below 1.5 C, we have less than a 400 gigaton CO2 budget to spend all the time getting to zero emission. We emit, in the, uh, as a global community, we emit at about 50 gigatons a year. So uh, our budget is something around 300 gigatons. So in six years, we're done. 
if we start reducing immediately, we could extend those six years. Uh, nothing much is happening. <laughs> so that six years is probably being shortened. And in fact, you'll see um, the summary of all of this is without aggressive progress, limiting warming to 1.5 C is not possible. It used to be seven years when I first presented this a few weeks ago, and then a couple weeks later, it was five years. Um, aggressive measures will get us to 2C, and really aggressive. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and if we do just modest what's comfortable, what's good in Congress, what's, you know, <laughs> what's palatable, what both sides of the aisle would do, I mean, put in all the qualifiers you want, uh, we're in a whole lot of hurt in, in a few decades. And unfortunately, it's not the we, it's our kids and our grandkids. Uh, and that, that's what makes this all so difficult. So you drive the reality home, you then bring on the summary recommendations. And this example, uh, we were discussing zero, uh, net zero and carbon neutral legislation. Uh, this was a discussion we were having with, in fact, the um, a representative, a staffer who works with the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. And so he chose to expand um, that bullet topic and talk specifically about some legislation. In a meeting with Senator Gillibrand's office, uh, Jared Jones, we inserted things under each bullet item to discuss prospects for jobs. So you add the detail that's relevant to the discussion you're gonna have. Um, you can then sit and talk about the, the, uh, the technology roadmap and the whole technology roadmap approach. Um, and I like to summarize it as by saying, what we're facing is a massive engineering challenge intertwined with a public policy challenge, all wrapped up in a geopolitical challenge. Because we're not alone. We have to get the rest of the world to do this too. And that's often an excuse for doing nothing. Um, and there are a lot of issues with that argument. We don't have time to go into that, but um, there's some key points we make in, in closing that you know, legislation alone will not adequately address the crisis. Market forces alone will not move us to a solution with sufficient speed. We don't have 50 years to do this. Um, we must address the crisis with the manufacturing capacity, tools, and methods needed to fight a war against an existential threat. And so you, you can find some nice examples of big threats or big challenges, whether it's Sputnik, World War II, the Cold War, 9-11, and you look at the kind of expenditures that, that you know, this country did. Um, and this challenge is certainly up there with any one of those. Uh, and you know, we're not talking about spending it all at once, we're talking about over the next decades, uh, you know, taking bold action. So, uh, you know, in, in, in our view, those who balk at the price tag for addressing the climate crisis are, are either ill-informed as to its severity or they're just disingenuous in their purported concern. Uh, so at the end of each of these, you know, slide decks, you have a discussion. And so this was from, uh, I believe, the discussion with uh, Jared Jones we wanted to discuss where middle-class jobs for America fits into the roadmap picture, um, where we can have impact with key Senate committees. And in this case, uh, energy and natural resources is a big one because we have Joe Manchin heading that up. Um, and then commerce, science and transportation uh, is, is uh, another one in, in the Senate. And because Senator Gillibrand is a, a Senator uh, the thought would be maybe she could reach out to fellow senators or share or her staffers could share staff contact. Uh, and then more generally, you know, what what kind of advocacy and outreach could we do with key elected do officials? Elected officials. So, so this slide, this slide should occupy, should occupy about, about half, half of the meeting. Of the, you know, you, you, you get, know through you get through all the background and leave half the meeting for this. Um, and then you, you know, you, you, you go places. So I'm going to give you some highlights now from recent advocacy efforts. Um, just want to do a time check here. Looking pretty good. Um, so we sent an email, and Shil did this, uh, after we first had the, um, 
roadmap uh, submitted in draft form to uh, a publisher. He reached out to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and immediately they got back and they wanted to discuss this document. They wanted a copy. Um, we met with four people who actually read through it, and they were very interested in doing stuff with it. The problem they have is if they distribute or publish any of it, they are concerned about copyright infringement because it's been submitted for publication. So until we have the publication details completed, um, we can't do much more with them, but the activities we discussed as possible were disseminating pieces of this roadmap to member uh, and partner scientific and engineering societies and having events uh, between these societies to engage. Um, so now you could expand, for instance, MACA's effective membership, if you will, to all these science and engineering societies if people want to take this roadmap message to their representation. Um, as I mentioned, I sent an email to a staffer in Joe Morelli's office. Um, that resulted in a meeting with the deputy district manager, Kaylee Benedict, and um, that bore some fruit because she provided some contact, some context and some feedback. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, we sent an email to Tim Ryder of Senator Schumer's office. Immediately, we had a meeting with Tim Ryder. Um, we also have a contact from Kaylee Benedict in Senator Schumer's office we would like to follow up with to go a little deeper. Um, but as an outgrowth of the discussion with Kaylee Benedict, we got a response from a staffer in the House Select Committee on um, Climate Change. And that staffer uh, met with us and we had a nice long discussion about the roadmap, about advocacy and so on. And that staffer's name is Zach Pritchard. He was one of these fellows, congressional fellows serving this committee. Um, so what came out of all of this? The AAAS expressed interest in working with us to engage with colleagues in other scientific and engineering societies. We, you know, that's on the back burner until we get publication details. Uh, Kaylee Benedict provided contacts for Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schumer, forwarded our information to two House committees, resulting in contact with the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. She basically said to the two committees, you two decide which committee is most appropriate to discuss this stuff with MACA. You guys should get together. We ended up with the House Select Committee, um, okay. which was really quite informative. Jeremy? Uh, Jeremy, yes. before we leave the subject, I did have one, one question uh, from uh, uh, Shahalida Daya. I think he's one of your guys. Um, sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just for the sake of time, let me just read it and see what your, what your answer is. Uh, it says, what is Jeremy's perspective on the bipartisan and democratic infrastructure bills currently in Congress with regard to our, abil our ability to fight climate change? <laughs> um, That'll put your schedule behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, why don't we save that for later? Okay, we'll hold it. Thank uh, you. Because yeah, that, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, so Zach Pritchard from this uh, House Select Committee gave us guidance on advocacy efforts and suggestions on where the roadmap message is most relevant. And to part of Shill's question, he said, yeah, you guys should do a lot of this. Unfortunately, the people who need to hear it are sticky wickets and they're tough to talk to. And if you got to pick one, you got to pick one who's important. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, you don't want to pick one who you know his views negative and has no power or influence. So don't bother. You know, go for the one who's got a little more position of authority. Uh, and even if he's a tough nut, you you got to, you know, try to engage him. We have to work in that direction because I, I think otherwise it. It can be hopeless. Um, Jared Jones, uh, when we met with him, he provided a lot of guidance and requested, interestingly, climate-related policy suggestions relevant to Senator Gillibrand's committees she serves on. So he said, you know, we know that the climate challenge touches all sectors of the economy. It's got to touch every committee in Congress. So pick the committees my senator serves on. Give us specific recommendations that my senator can take to those committees for action. That's not a bad thing to suggest. So we're actually engaged in a follow-up activity in Laurel Kearney 
uh, took one of the two action items, which was to address the Armed Services Committee with possibly some thoughts on uh, green hydrogen. Um, and the other is the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. And um, uh, Michael Rubin is, is helping on that one. Uh, but more interestingly, before we ever got to that discussion, Jared Jones was looking at the graphic and he said, Climate Action Authority, where do you think that should live? You know, what organization is it? Is it a committee? Is it uh, an administration function? What is it? And we chatted about that for a while because he thought it was important and he, he, he had some thoughts on what it should be. And, you know, we had our concerns that seating it in the um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency might be dangerous because it was gutted so recently, but EPA should somehow be involved. DOE should be involved. But more importantly, you have the uh, Office of the Climate Advisor, which is Gina McCarthy, and she's in the administration. So we talked about, you know, where the Climate Action Authority would live, and maybe we should come up with some more concrete thoughts on that because uh, he felt it was an important item. And interestingly, Shill. Um, believes that that feature of our roadmap is a distinguishing feature amongst all kinds of roadmap documents you'll find that other groups have put out, you know, recommendations for climate action. Um, so here were some general responses we got in the, in, in the process of having these conversations. Uh, Kaylee started off, you know, it was our first big meeting with, with a, an official, and she felt that the roadmap is helpful for legislators to put the challenge into perspective. She hadn't seen such a thing. She was unfamiliar with roadmaps. She wage, made it, you know, a fair wager that almost nobody in Congress is familiar with such a thing. Um, and in fact, in talking to Zach Pritchard, he said, yeah, that's probably true. There might be some staffers who are um, there might be some congressional representatives have some business experience or technology experience, but by and large, Kaylee's right. And he said, more importantly, um, the kind of people who need to be taking that point of view and should have that roadmap perspective should be in Gina McCarthy's office. So I do believe we want to open up some dialogue, but getting to Gina McCarthy's tall order. I did find out, however, that her deputy, um, uh, deputy advisor on climate is a former New York State official who worked in the New York State environment stuff. So I'm thinking we can work our way through the New York State contacts um, to get to that deputy and that would be an important thing to do. Um, another thought that Kaylee shared was reaching out to staff and key committees is appropriate. That was what we had thought. So she said, yes, absolutely, that's the way to do things. Um, presenting the roadmap to the Senate Majority Leader would be a good thing to do. Uh, we know Schumer's motivated on this. Um, expanding his view of the thing and giving him a technical picture might not be a bad thing. Um, and Zach said, you know, Zach Pritchard, finding key opposition members of Congress and reaching out to present nonpartisan MAC of you could be helpful, but difficult. And that's, that's the key. It's, he's saying, yeah, we got to do it, but uh, good luck to you. Um, <laughs> and more importantly, he confirmed the wisdom of our approach on engagement. And he basically reiterated our three-step approach. Identify actions and positions that the people you're trying to reach have. Use those actions and positions as hooks by acknowledging them, thanking them, and connecting them with the roadmap and then make a specific request. Can we discuss this particular thing? Can we meet to discuss this? Can you provide me a contact for this? So um, we do in fact have something like 20 minutes to discuss. This is my closing slide. I'll go through the closing slide and then I will take a deep breath and try to answer Shill's question. Uh, so what I wanted to leave us with is MACA is poised to make impact on climate legislation and policy at the national level. Uh, the roadmap provides a central foundation for engagement with elected leaders and policymakers. The roadmap and formula developed to generate emails of engagement is a useful 
um, tool. Uh, we've developed a roadmap and formula to produce meeting slide decks as follow-up from emails of engagement. So to get the right email sent, you get a response, you got a slide deck ready, you schedule the meeting, and now you have half an hour to an hour of somebody's time. And if you do well with that half an hour, an hour, they'll give you contacts or they might give you access to maybe five minutes of a really important person's time. And then you got to use those five minutes really well. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the thought behind all of this. And, uh, you know, we also have MACA members developing additional detailed papers on important issues such as green hydrogen, EV adoption, and so on, uh, to complement the roadmap. Because once you start talking about the roadmap and people generally get engaged, they ask detailed questions. Well, what do you think we should do about this? How do you think we should, get, you know, get EV adoption going up? What, what kind of a charging infrastructure do you envision? So then they get to these details and you kind of feel foolish because <laughs> you're going a little too fast, but we do need to go fast. So, so we need to have uh, you know, the details worked out enough to generate the conversation. And then we need to follow through if we don't have those details and we'd like to be part of that discussion, we've got to go and do our homework and come back. Um, so that's the process. Um, that's the status of where we are. I invite any MIT alum uh, to join MACA and to join this thrust. Uh, it's so easy to churn out these letters and get these meetings. It is not easy for one person to do it all for 50 states. And it, it's simply not workable. So um, I've had the benefit of colleagues in New York State and, and Shill's guidance. What we'd like to do is replicate this, you know, as much as possible and as far wide as possible, far flung. And so, you know, we're thinking about orienting people on the roadmap, training people on how to craft these letters, um, how to create the slide decks. We would have common materials we could draw from, common messaging. So if you get the message points right, you've got the materials to back you up, you've got the formula to, you know, generate the contacts. Um, you know, we can do a lot of things as a large group. Uh, okay. So we've got, we've got two questions uh, lined up already. Uh, the first okay. one is uh, the one that we read before, and then uh, Lawrence Poster would like to uh, uh, spend a few minutes uh, uh, actually discussing what needs to be done. Uh, okay. If you can do it, whatever, whatever order, whatever order. Do you want to handle right. it first? First. So yeah, I'll take Shill's question first. I mean, this is my personal view. This is not the Mac of you. Um, my personal view is our country's in a hot mess, and the only way I see anything getting done is reconciliation, budget reconciliation. And it's a sad fact, but I, I do not see a single Republican going far enough with anything meaningful. That um, the only things they feel comfortable signing up to because of fear of loss of base, fear of loss of who knows what, um, is, is becomes almost meaningless. Um, so, you know, when you make something palatable to both sides, you make it worthless in this environment. And that's a shame. Uh, that being said, there might be small things that could be palatable to both sides. And if we find those, let's do it. So take the infrastructure bill, find something you can get your 60 votes on, push it through. And anything else you're going to have to do by reconciliation, <laughs> because what you get through isn't going to be enough. So I, I, I do not hold a high hope for Congress solving this problem. Um, that being said, the more we talk about this and try to influence this Congress that we all have such disdain for, um, we have a chance at making some kind of change. And more importantly, federal legislation isn't sufficient to get all this done. There's local, state by state, there's private market, there's personal, personal action. So it will take everything. It will take us throwing everything at this problem. So um, just because the federal government won't act doesn't mean it won't follow at some level. And, and you know, when, when we pulled out of uh, the Paris Accord, the first thing that happened was, you know, California, New York, I think Massachusetts, a whole bunch of other states said, wait a minute, no, we're, we're committed to this. 
So I, I think there will be smaller entities leading and the federal government might be following. But somehow we have to be helping push that, helping make that change. Okay. So that's my long-winded answer to Shill's question. Okay. Shill, feel free to respond. <laughs> now, well, you know, I just heard Bernie Sanders on the NewsHour talk about these two bills. So that the first one is the bipartisan one, which essentially has been gutted by uh, the moderates. And so there's really very little, I think, left in terms of uh, climate uh, legislation in that one. And even even without that, it, it seems like it may not pass. I mean, it probably they'll they'll pull it through in the last minute. But I don't think it's going to do a lot. It's it's a I think it's pretty big. It's like a trillion dollars or something. Um, and then there's a second one which Bernie is is leading the way on, which they're saying that there's they're getting a lot of criticism from uh, Republicans, but they're not expecting a single vote. Uh, from a Republican. So the only way that's going to pass is the way in which you were suggesting the, uh, the reconciliation. And so I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like we have a small opportunity with the Democratic Senate, uh, but I, I wouldn't hold my breath. You want something to last. Okay. Let me, let me break in here. I'd like to uh, uh, give uh, Lawrence uh, Pouster a chance. I noticed he's not, he's not muted to see what he's he says about uh, getting moving on these things. And then sure. let's, uh, then I think we'll be back to this issue of what, what we can do with Congress because uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Shell. I uh, think you, yeah, <laughs> how we respond. So let's, if I, if I may, let's hear from uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Pastor now about uh, uh, what do you think needs to be done? Thank you. Uh, uh, poster. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, first, Jeremy mentioned at the very tail end of his great uh, talk that he doesn't think Congress is the answer, or I'm not sure if he meant this Congress or Congress in general, uh, but that's part of the problem. Congress, in my opinion, is not the answer. Uh, climate change, and I think we have to get back to global warming. Words matter, and uh, climate change is benign. I think we need to make a point that this is global warming and it's not benign. And I think global warming is happening even faster than we think. And I don't think we know how fast the change actually is. And I think we need to know that. I think we need to see what we thought five years ago and 10 years ago and how fast things have moved against what we had thought back then to know how fast this thing is accelerating. And without that knowledge, we can't do some of the things that I think we need to do. You know, one, if you recall the advertising by the Lincoln Project back uh, in the uh, Biden-Trump uh, election cycle, uh, that kind of advertising is necessary. We have to communicate to the public. Uh, and by the way, uh, when you do that, also CEOs of Exxon and et cetera, listen, they hear that and they, hear what the reaction to that kind of advertising is. So that's a multi hundred million dollar investment that has to get made. And until the public is aboard, you're not gonna achieve what you wanna achieve. Also here in the, this country, we don't know how important the US is versus uh, the rest of the world. So whatever we do, are we moving faster than Europe? Are we moving faster than China and India? Or are we moving slower? I think we need to have that context and things can change. We might've been moving slower and now we're moving faster. I don't know, but China is still bringing aboard coal fired uh, you know, uh, facilities. Uh, I mean, that's crazy. Uh, and we can't be quiet about what's going on in China or India or anywhere else. Europe has gotten a message I'm sure last week in this from the floods. Uh, so I think Europe might be, and there of course, the uh, you know, where Paris is. So, I mean, the Paris Accords were there. Um, but I think what really needs to get done uh, to move fast is to get the uh, carbon polluters on board. If you get the carbon polluters on board, uh, and when you're wrestling a beast, you wrestle the head and you bring the dinosaur down. Uh, so, you know, all this Lilliputian stuff on, in Congress, uh, you still need to do it, but 
you know, we're going to be past the uh, point of no return before Congress acts. Yeah. The, the uh, Exxons, the uh, Shells, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, oil industry and gas industry uh, heads, uh, not just the corporations, but the CEOs uh, need to be finally aboard. And the way they can be aboard is if they can be shown how they can transform their companies to profit-making companies doing something else in the way of energy and power and, and related storage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, until they can see and then their shareholders can believe that they can make even more money than they're currently making. Uh, and in 10 years, not in 40 years, uh, this thing is not gonna happen. But once these companies tell Congress, i.e. Republicans, that they're now shifted to clean energy philosophically and then within 10 years completely, uh, Congress is not gonna budge. But once Congress gets that you know, word, uh, they're gonna move. Uh, yeah. Then of course, we still have the problem of the rest of the world. And yeah. again, I don't know the context, but also with respect to uh, MIT, other universities are doing exactly or similar things to us. Uh, we can't be all doing similar things in separate silos. It has to be done together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me stop you there because I've got a couple, oh, of, a couple of comments. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I wanted to do is I want to uh, jump over, jump a little bit. Linda had uh, Linda Anthony, I think it is, uh, has has another attack besides uh, uh, approaching Congress. So, uh, Linda, you want to unmute and uh, tell us your comment about state legislatures? Give her a minute. I think you can unmute yourself. Right Wait a minute here. Okay, unmute. thank we you. Can Good. you hear me? Yeah, we, we got you. Okay, so um, thank you for this fascinating point of view. Rara MIT, it covers all the bases of science, engineering, technology, and policy, you name it. And it's really important. Um, my question is, have any of your ally, the staffer that said, choose your battles, look for the legislators that are in positions of power and can do something. I mean, we've got Schumer and Gillibrand. Has anybody on your team tackled anybody from any red states that show any promise? Anybody who may not be totally entrenched in fossil fuels, but have that point of connection to maybe wake up and be aware of what's going on and do something? I, I think I mean, the answer, the easy answer, the quick answer is no, not yet. Uh, but I, we have an eye on that. And I think we, we felt we would start locally, even though we we're talking to allies, we got a sense for what, how well informed they are and how helpful our view could be to them and asked for their input on how we could be helpful. I think Mansion would be like a warm up to talking to a red state. <laughs> uh, so if we could, if we could get a connection with Manchin and sit him down and say, look, you know, we understand what you're beholden to or what you think you're beholden to. Let's put that aside for a minute and let's talk about the future and let's, you know, let, let's just stick to some facts here and try to get him to understand that he's in a position not just to be a big macher, but he's also in a position to help the world. And yeah. we have to have that conversation with him. And that would be the warm up to talking to people who are, I hate to say it, far worse. But, <laughs> you know, because we're, and, and I've said this several times, and I think she'll abide by it as well. We are nonpartisan, but we are not apolitical. Okay. Being nonpartisan means I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican but I can still see that the current Republican Congress is useless on climate change. And that as long as the Republicans are in control, the important issue of climate change will never be addressed. That is not a partisan statement. That is a political reality. And, and, and both parties play horrible football with making statements like that sound like political invective when it's not, it's, it's fact. This is the politics, you, you know, they're making the politics. I'm not a card carrying either one of them. You know, I can, I can put that aside. I'm there, you know, I, they don't own my vote. But I can still say that on this issue, 
A side is wrong and A side is right. So we have to exercise that. And I think, I think Joe Manchin would be a great warm up. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very yeah. much. I like your spirit. You started with the allies to test yeah. your roadmap and hone your skills and uh, maybe yep. Manchin is the next step. Thank you so yep. much. Yep. Okay. And in fact, Jared Jones, he asked us when we were you know, talking, he said, please consider me an ally. Okay. So, you yeah. know. Good. Very good. We had a question from uh, Shamaya Das. Boy, I'm massacring everybody's name here. Uh, but you want to take it? It talks about best, best yeah. 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 I think this is the follow up question uh, regarding uh, Senator Manchin. Who has, uh, is a roadblock to Biden's, President Biden's infrastructure plan? Um, he has a constituency dependent on coal. I can understand that because those are the people who economic livelihood depend on coal and Manchin can't kind of neglect them. Now, we have to provide not just a, a viewpoint and try to convert him. We have to provide some technical analysis. Germany has successfully decarbonized its coal sector spending Euro 50 billion. Um, I think the Biden's, uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan should have a pretty large amount of money set, set aside for dealing with that. And I think, uh, you know, put it in plain words, bribery helps when you cannot cajole people through, you know, ideas. And yes, it's a bribe. You can look upon it in that way. But I see, you know, you have to provide money to these people. They are, I mean, I think it's fair only that these people who are dependent on coal suddenly can't stop their activities just because, you know, of climate. So uh, if there is a substantial amount of money set, set aside to deal with this problem of, of shutting down these coal mines and the coal fired power, power plants in West Virginia, finding them jobs, providing them with training, like Germany has done, a substantial amount of money, which is earmarked for this purpose, which we could develop as part of this MACA initiative. I think then there is a reasonable chance that we can sway Senator Mankin. Thank you. Okay, well, I thought you asked, before, before, before you leave, I thought you asked an interesting question about whether, we, whether uh, uh, MACA can do anything about uh, disinformation. Yes, I, in fact, I have been on LinkedIn quite a bit and I posted some uh, of my views about, you know, climate um, change and greenhouse gas emissions and what's going on. And I'm appalled to see the enormous amount, number of people who are totally spreading misinformation, providing, uh, uh, you know, uh, data, marshalling people from universities who have, you know, all kinds of views on, on the subject and trying to distort the picture. Now, what can we do to, you know, uh, address this? Can we prepare something which uh, deals with this problem? You know, it's like the COVID vaccine. There are people who don't want, don't believe in vaccination, right? Who who um, uh, refuse to take vaccines. So, how do we deal with this? This is a complex issue, but I'm just raising this as something which we need to address, because if you want to. It's not just a question of influencing senators or congressmen or, or, or you know, con congressional people. You have to ultimately convince people at large, the public, the American public. And I think we should come up with some um, paper or some whatever it is, which explains this in simple terms and can, you know, generate the support which we need for this to work. Okay. Uh, very good. And I just want to bring in, well, we, got, we, have some, we have a couple of Canadians here with us. Uh, Rowena, uh, you talked about what's going on in Victoria, in Vancouver, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, also, um, is it Myron? Just a second here. Um, get her right. uh, Myron is from, from Alberta. First, uh, uh, Rowena, uh, what's the Canadian attitude, particularly Western Canada, which is oil rich and that kind of thing? Do you have trouble convincing people there to uh, that, that global warming is real? Um, I, to be very honest, I haven't talked to any politicians just yet. I suspect it's um, 
uh, two-faced. One side, they want the uh, climate change and they're pouring a lot of money into green tech. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they're still uh, cutting down old growth forests and, um, and all that. So uh, I, I don't have a definitive answer just yet. Oh, okay. And uh, for Myron, uh, I spent the, just want to add, uh, put, put my two cents in here. Uh, I was just in Montpelier, Vermont, uh, visiting my grandkids over the weekend. And there was a demonstration in front of a uh, bank that apparently was loaning men money to the Alberta companies working on tar sands and they wanted them to stop. Uh, I guess my question for you would be, besides the heat dome, that's going, the, the crop failures and everything else going on in Alberta, does anybody in Alberta maybe associate that with climate change or is it just a heat wave? Um, this is his wife, Marilyn Siegel. And Alberta is very much an energy province. Um, and not everybody supports the oil industry. It is very powerful here. Our provincial government is very right wing. Um, we're not quite Texas North, but not everybody supports the provincial United Conservative Party. Um, I think people are waking up that we've had significant adverse events here related to climate change. We had a huge flood in the Calgary and uh, High River regions in 2013. We've had huge forest fires. The city of Fort McMurray was devastated by a massive forest fire in 2016. So people are waking up, it's very real. There has been significant protests about proposed coal, metallurgical coal development on the Eastern slopes of the Rockies by at least one coal firm from Australia who thought they could make a lot of money because the royalty rates are low. That was opposed uh, at the very large grassroots level, but they're trying to go back at it again with litigation. So there's some good things happening in the province of Alberta, but it's very slow and um, it could almost be characterized as one step forward, two steps or many more steps back. Moreover, there's a federal election that will likely happen this fall. Those of us who watch our federal um, elected officials are seeing, we don't have fixed election dates like you do. We've got terms that have maximums. So we are hoping, we're thinking there will be a federal election this autumn and climate change and the environment are very significant issues. Nonetheless, in Western Canada, we're expecting, unfortunately, that we'll have um, conservative people return to Ottawa, but they don't have the balance of power there. Yeah, totally. So maybe the Liberals will come back. Hope so. Uh, okay, Carol, I had, uh, uh, had an interesting take on, I think that this, the, the whole uh, discussion is going towards uh, uh, towards uh, validating what Jeremy said about getting people moving. It's going to be a real problem. But Carla, if you're still with us, I think you talked about the urgency of global warming. I'd like you to uh, say a few, a few things about that. There you go. You're going to have to. I mean, I'm trying to put myself on on video. You no, it. I. No, I see that there's a lot of people who still don't understand the effects of what's going on in terms of climate change and global warming. Um, and then coming out of MIT as well, it's, I think it's a message that should, should be said to, so for the common people to understand um, and not to the politicians as much, but if there's any way that we can drive a message that the common people can understand, whereas that can influence the politicians. Yeah. Because right now the politicians are really afraid of being voted out. If it doesn't mean that the con you know, like the base is is supporting them. So in the in the states that are in the South or any of the coal industries, um, um, I've, I'm before when I was from Pennsylvania, where there was a lot of cement plants, um, coal they don't want to hear about climate change. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So you have to make it so that they're not fearful, um, especially the people who have union jobs, that they know that they will have those jobs coming in because climate change will provide more jobs for them. So I, I think that there's a lot of fear, fear around, um, especially America, in terms of jobs going away because we're gonna um, try to decarbonize um, and really push climate change. Yeah, and, and that's an example of what I call one-dimensional thinking. Um, the thing that's demagogued is what's lost and there's no recognition of what's gained and uh, there's no sense of proportion. So if you look at all the jobs tied up in coal, it's a drop in the bucket yeah. for the economy. And when you look at renewables, what, what are currently employed in renewables, and if that were to grow many fold, because it has to, you know, to address climate change, the amount of jobs produced there would dwarf the amount of jobs lost in coal. Um, now, the trick is that there's not a one-to-one what do I want to say, replacement. You know, you can't replace a job in Virginia, West Virginia, with some, some job in Colorado. But uh, there are opportunities that can be distributed and um, there are ways to either retrain or otherwise, you know, if, if it got bad enough, let's face it, if someone was close enough to retirement, the government should be able to say, you'll be whole, you get a pension, don't worry, you know. Um, and if you can help while you're being sustained on the government's, you know, <laughs> dime, we'd love to have you help in this area. But in, in most cases, you should be able to train people or find things. And in, in particular, when there's talk of use of old retired coal and, foss and fossil fuel assets, uh, particularly wells um, and mines, for possible sequestration sites, things like that, you're talking about the same skill sets involved. You know, the petroleum industry could move many of those jobs into putting carbon back into the earth instead of taking it out uh, if there were large scale carbon sequestration. Not saying that's, you know, 100% probable, but it's something that's being seriously considered. And, it, you know, it should be mentioned that those skills would be needed and we'd need people transferring their jobs from drilling for oil to helping find clever ways to capture and, and store it, uh, yeah. capture and store carbon. Okay, uh, Claude, you've got a comment and then I want to get on to Kenny Kuroski. Uh, Claude, you got your hand yes. up? Yeah, I guess, let me just pull my hand down. Go ahead. So, so I'm a, uh, you know, one of the uh, members of MACA uh, on the roadmap uh, group. I'm in Florida and so have a very different uh, approach because our senators and our governor uh, are firmly committed to doing nothing. In fact, uh, our legislature, our state legislature, keeps passing bills to um, prevent uh, the various departments within the state from considering global warming when making any rules and regulations. Um, most of my uh, attention really has been focused on the State Public Service uh, Utilities Commission uh, because even they were aghast when the uh, utilities this year uh, for the next five years said that uh, the uh, economies uh, in, uh, that they're planning in the energy sector will be zero. So, uh, for the time being, uh, it's really a bottoms up approach in, in the red states. Uh, eventually, I think that uh, the, something, something catastrophic will happen to the point where the president can declare war, really war on ourselves, but it'll be war on nature. And that's going to be the only way we can overcome the inertia of the uh, congressional bodies and the states. Okay. 
Uh, very good. Uh, Ken, you had, a, you had a quick suggestion for uh, uh, mansion in West Virginia and red states. Yeah, thanks. So first of all, thanks very much, Jeremy, for the excellent presentation. And I should point out, well, as, a, uh, as a sophomore, I took um, a semester off and worked as a um, Senate intern in Washington, DC, which, which convinced me to become an electrical engineer rather than a <laughs> politician. But, um, but one thing I learned is that, you know, the representatives and senators will listen to their constituents, um, you know, much with uh, much more than with, uh, with, with people from, from out of state. So my suggestion was just, uh, do we have some uh, involved um, uh, alum MACA members um, in West Virginia, for example, that could be involved in approaching the Senator Mansion, for example, not necessarily, um, exclusively um, but but that could kind of take the lead and 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 also for uh, um, for red uh, red states as well um, involving local local alumni in that uh, representatives district I think would be would be helpful um, to the cause here sure. did you want to make a comment uh, so yeah um, so th that's a really good idea Ken uh, and you know the infinite uh, connection, provides a very easy way for us to uh, find people in various places. We don't have any members at the moment from West Virginia. I think I'm probably the closest. I'm in Maryland uh, and I grew up, I actually went to, to high school and uh, junior high school there uh, during the time of uh, Robert Byrd and uh, Jay Rockefeller. Uh, that was a time right after, you know, after the Kennedy election where West Virginia was the tipping uh, in favor of the Democrats. So it's changed radically since then. But I would feel comfortable writing to him, but as you say, it's much better to have someone who's actually one of his constituents. So what we, what we really need is to find someone who knows one of the uh, current residents. I think there, there's probably, I think I, I looked, I think there are a dozen MIT alumni in the Infinite Connection in West Virginia. Uh, so, so we should be able to find it. Probably they would all be willing to do it if, uh, you know, if one of us reached out to them. Good idea. Okay, um, very good. I want to get back to uh, uh, Deborah Chung. Uh, first, uh, sorry, I, I managed to, I'm trying to keep up with things, but I um, uh, passed over you uh, and I didn't mean to. Uh, you had a comment about Domtap forms of, of energy, a research on it and the need for uh, enterprises such as NFF uh, NSF to open up new science, which is sort of my question, you know, what about nuclear and some of the other things? But Deborah, go ahead, if you can, please. Yes, um, if you look at the call for proposals from places like NSF or DOE, they, they have specific pockets of money just for those well-known energy technologies, wind, battery and, and uh, so on, okay? Uh, but it's time for us to broaden our horizon and look at new technologies. But the structure of the funding agencies has those pockets. If, you do, if your technology is not in one of those established pockets, uh, you go nowhere. Um, I, I think this is such a shame. Yeah, I, there's this whole problem of wanting a return on assets, even when it's not a business, right? <laughs> so the government doesn't bet very well or doesn't bet, what do I want to say, aggressively. Um, they'll probably fund things that they think are more possible, which if that's always your limitation on what you're going to try, you, you, your discovery process is stunted. That being said, you know, I do believe there are programs within the government that understand that and fund, you know, really pure research. Um, the question is, can you bring some of that into the climate fold? You know, if we had policies that funded what we think are the future technologies to address the hopefully end game of reduction of carbon, um, what would that look like and what kinds of technologies could you imagine? And, you know, I would hope that if that were opened up, the proposal process would be less uh, um, stale 
as, as what you're describing and, and more interested in new ideas. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the near term stuff, you have to do stuff that you have a reasonable belief is going to work for the intermediate stuff, less so, and for the longer term, even less so. Okay. The reality is we only have half a dozen years or less to act. So we've got to do all that, what we know how to do now and do it big. And while we're doing that, we have to have set aside money to start at, at the same time in parallel, all that research. And it gets back to, if you don't understand this and you don't have this picture in your mind of a roadmap, you're just gonna go for that carbon pricing bill or that yeah. infrastructure bill and think you've solved the problem. Yeah, yeah. it's certainly it's the complicated, complicated complexity of the problem is becoming really clear. Yeah. I mean, uh, I hate to say it, but we need project managers. I really hate to say that I worked for a few, but <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, we yeah. need that mentality. We need, we need, and, and, and I think it, it goes back to it's up in Gina McCarthy's office. We need people at the top saying, this is not the way you're going to solve this problem. It's certainly going to take strong leadership because, boy, <clears throat> we've shown uh, just the last six months have shown what uh, somebody with a, with a following and a uh, microphone can uh, do to public opinion in terms of spreading, you know, you're fighting disinformation that's really <laughs> tough. Um, uh, Steve Sherwood, uh, you had kind of a proposal, at least on uh, how to handle uh, job obsolescence, I'll call it, for the, all the uh, West Virginia coal miners. And actually, she'll have a follow up on that. But Sherwood, what's your idea? Oh, hi. I, I wrote it in the chat. Um, I just think that we need to think about um, uh, taking care of the, the losers. You know, it, it's not that expensive, but it, we, we, we let concern over coal jobs and shale jobs, so on, um, you know, have more uh, weight in discussions that it's worth. It's really about taking care of the shareholders and the owners and the people making all the money, but that's not evident. So if you just, I don't know, part of any plan should be to take care of the people who are attracting the sympathy and because uh, it's not that expensive to do that. Right. Yeah, relative to the cost of not doing nothing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, exactly. Shemayadas, uh, yeah, you had you had a follow up on that. I thought that was interesting. I would just comment that Mecca needs to really prepare a, uh, a policy paper, a white paper on a program and how to deal with coal miners and lost jobs, which we can present to Senator Manchin and other policymakers, including Republican politicians. I think there's a group of Republican politicians who are actually quite aware of this climate issue and are very sympathetic, but they need to have the proper um, technical analysis and policy proposals. Um, I think this program, which I'm talking about, to comprise a substantial investment program in green energy, solar, wind, and others, uh, uh, payment for job losses, which was just mentioned by the previous speaker, training programs, and, um, you know, um, a program which can draw also on the experience of other countries so that it's not just our, um, you know, views right now, but we draw upon uh, uh, proposals or policies which have worked. So I think a, a policy paper on, uh, on a subject, you know, in, a, in this light can help to, to, to convey our views in a systematic way. Thank you. But, but Shandash, the, the problem is that all of that is in the infrastructure, democratic infrastructure bill, and there isn't a single rep Republican who's going to get within, you know, 10 million light years of it. So uh, I don't know that a, our writing uh, a, a white paper on that is going to convince them. I think the basic, again, I repeat, the Senator Manchin and uh, Senator Sinema are two stumbling blocks on this whole infrastructure program. And uh, the only way we can, you know, uh, to, you know uh, convert their minds or whatever is to, uh, you know, well, we can't, obviously can't say that we'll succeed, but at least we can provide them with some material and ammunition to, to understand this whole issue. Yeah, they're Democrats though. <laughs> yes, they're Democrats, but they're only Democrats. 
They're not all bad, you know. <laughs> no, they, they are well, they have a constituency which they have to deal with. But, and I, I think that, you know, again, those people who are going to lose jobs and their livelihoods, they have to be compensated in some way. Yeah. And this is a trivial expense compared to the issue which we are trying to tackle. Yeah, uh, Myron, you had a comment on uh, uh, an alternative employment for some of these people who should be uh, 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 a sequ sequ carbon sequestration. And I've heard a lot of a lot of uh, remarks about that. That is seriously considered in the states too. But boy, they're going to have to get. I'm not sure what we're going to do. Is, is it really going to happen in Canada? She's still here. I think she is. Maybe not. Oh well. Uh, at any rate. Um, uh, Claude, you're talking about uh, full salary for the coal miners for the next five years? Sounds pretty good to me. Or a tax on carbon. Yeah, Claude, you had a couple of yeah, comments. I'm there. Go sorry. Ahead. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, infrastructure plans, I think it's, you know, the, the new Biden plan uh, has five years of guaranteed full salary for the four coal miners displaced by uh, um, the change in our energy sources, along with money for retraining. And this was uh, done expressly to try to get Manchin on board, obviously. Um, as far as um, direct air carbon capture, for example, the, uh, the Gates plan uh, is, is, doing, is, is doing, going ahead with that, but it's to, um, with the realization that it's just to offset uh, the emissions from very hard to um, electrify industries. It's not, direct air capture is not and does not look like it will ever be um, economical enough for uh, general overall use. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the, um, climate groups are, are against it um, because they see or feel that uh, people will uh, say, well, we'll just suck it out of the air. Um, right, it, it, it has to be used sparingly. And yet-, now, and yet Oh, Jeremy, I just had one other comment. In the near term, something that can uh, hopefully convince a lot of Republican states to go ahead with our plans. In the near term, the United States will be a net world exporter of liquefied natural gas. Ideally, none of, it, none of it will get burned in this country, but we will use it, we will sell it abroad to those who can afford it, and it should be a major arm of our foreign policy to help countries that are relying on coal or burning wood um, to, to give them a, uh, an intermediate source of energy with much lower emissions. Well, that was argued that burning wood would be uh, okay because it's part of the biosphere and it just cycles yeah. around in that. I understand that the problem with fossil fuels is it's bringing stuff up that hasn't, that's been sequestered no longer. Well, so, no, it, you know, if, if it's, you know, if you're taking down your forest and leading to desertification, uh, then it's, oh, it's that's not. Different. Yeah, that's different. Um, okay, uh, there's still got a few more comments. Uh, actually, we have this, this site is open, but I thought that maybe I'd uh, thank, our, thank our speaker and close it. And if people want to have, just unmute your microphones, there are fewer, 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 few enough of us uh, left that you can have, have discussions. Uh, uh, a couple of things. First is Jeremy, thank you very much. You know, I, Thanks for inviting me. It was great. And uh, second thing is, boy, I'd say we've got our, our um, we've got our work cut out for us because boy, I think that somehow you got to change public public opinion big time. And I'm not quite sure how you do it in order to really get this thing rolling. That's well, it's so interesting, hard. you know, some of the other activities we discussed in our MACA meetings is going to local community groups. And uh, John Dabbles has talked about this and, and I have been, I put myself on the schedule for our local synagogue 
sometime this fall. And I'm gonna give a talk about, if I get on the program, um, about climate change and a, a concept called tikkun olam, which is taking care of the world. Uh, so I wanna connect it and get some of these people thinking about, you know, leaving the world a tiny bit better than you found it isn't gonna cut it here. Uh, <laughs> we, we gotta do something big. And, um, and you, you know, to explain it to people who are not scientific, I have a very simple picture, which is, you know, imagine a Petri dish with agar agar in it and a bacterial colony, and you know the story. The colony grows and it uses, consumes resources until it pollutes itself to death. The population stabilizes and dies off. And this planet is a Petri dish and we are the bacteria. And if we can't do any better than the bacteria, we're not worthy of the brains that we're putting in our skulls. But, you know, we have to talk about it in fairly basic terms. We're polluting ourselves to death. Um, and, you know, if they want to know more, you can say, well, it starts with the fact that, you know, carbon dioxide produces a greenhouse effect. But all the other complexity beyond that just obfuscates the, the, the dire message. Uh, and I think we can make these fairly punchy, poignant presentations to our communities and our schools. And on the other side, you've got Tamara Ledley educating the educators and they're teaching their students a little more refined, you know, detail about all this stuff. So we, we can all spread the word. Um, and I've had a big debate with myself over the past year and a half about, you know, is spitting in the wind of <laughs> a valuable thing. And that, and that works whether you're talking to politicians or people. Uh, just general public. If you're talking to politicians, you're not going to do that unless this person really has an important position and you have a shot at least nudging the needle. Uh, and then the public, you know, if you can get to large numbers and get the word out, great. But if you're going to sit there and debate somebody who's clearly not going to listen, you walk away. <laughs> yeah. um, it's be frustrating. Well, the first, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first approach to the first step to solving a problem is to recognize the problem and to, you know, get organized to fight it. So at least we got that far. And uh, uh, gee, I'm hoping that we find uh, a charismatic leader that can really bring things around that can combat all the disinformation and get some public, and you know, some of the public behind us, particularly in some of these red states and get this moving. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna close the meeting now because we're supposed to run an hour and we actually run an hour and a half, which is good. And uh, the tape will be there. And although I'm gonna stop the recording, I believe that you can continue to, uh, we can continue to have chats uh, uh, if we would like to. And uh, meanwhile, thank you very much. And uh, maybe another year or so, it'll be interesting to see whether uh, we made any progress, you know, see whether what's changed that way. So thanks for, thanks again for speaking. Speaking, Jeremy, and uh, uh, thanks everybody else for uh, joining and for uh, the lively discussion that we've had. And uh, I hope that I didn't step on anybody. I hope we got to everybody at least once. And I want to thank everybody for uh, contributing. Very good. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for having us. Thanks, thanks, Bob, for opening it up. Very good. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye all. Good night.